We have Ethan Trafalgar Square and we have Iftars at the Downings. Mostly we're talking about um, liberals who wear the visage uh, of the left. So it's like an aesthetic. Explain these structural forces that, that hem in even sincere people and make them into hypocrites, really. So they want you to be Muslim, but without any of the trappings of Islam. Party itself is a violent and oppressive structure. There is a, a window uh, that liberalism permits for anyone to operate inside of. Is it enough to be successful within a system of injustice? For as many years as I can remember, come election time, Western Muslim communities have been asked to support mainstream political parties in exchange for representation. Some commentators have praised the multiculturalism of countries like the UK, where the party system has integrated many Muslims into the political system. Here in London, we have Sadiq Khan, arguably the highest ranking elected Muslim official in the Western world. In the United States, there's a similar push for Muslims to support the Democrats and even the Republicans, and some have broken the glass ceiling and represent the parties at local and national levels. But does Muslim representation really work? On Gaza, we have seen the limits of the Muslim voice. What are the structural compromises the system will always want to solicit from Muslim representatives? Does the system only support particular types of candidates? And indeed, does the system change for people who set out to change the system? To explore this topic, I have with me in the studio today Dr. Asim Qureshi. Dr. Asim Qureshi is the research director at CAGE, a UK-based advocacy organisation working to empower communities impacted by the war on terror. He has a background in international law and is the author of the books Rules of the Game and a Virtue of Disobedience. Dr. Asim Qureshi, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to The Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Asim, um, it's now been a month in since um, the operations began in, in Gaza and I've heard from multiple Muslims that there's just a feeling of anger in the Muslim community. Like, How do you conceptualize this anger? Do you feel angry, Asim? Um, um, I don't think anger really fully captures what I'm feeling these days. Um, I think rageful is perhaps closer to the mark. Um, every single day uh, I see new images of dismembered bodies, of people who are really just trying their best to survive in, in, in extremely difficult circumstances. And it's amazing actually how, how full of courage they are as well at the same time. I think it's also those images that, that remind me that despondency is not part of our religion of Islam. Um, that, that rage, this rage that I feel, it has to be directed to something more, something better. Um, and that's really coming from them. Uh, it's, it's just such an interesting dynamic. Um, but yes, I feel full of rage. One part of that anger is uh, how Muslims perceive their Muslim representatives in parliament and in politics in general. Can you bring us up to speed with the position of these Muslim representatives, say here in the UK, the Labour Party, and their position on Gaza? So I think, you know, one of the things that we... we we have to question about the question itself is really why are we so interested and invested in the religious affiliations of those who represent us in parliament? What, what does it actually give us? What do we gain from, you know, somebody who professes to be of the same faith, but also then, you know, how do we, how do we, actualize our own politics um, despite them if they're not willing and able to to perform that function for us and i think the labor party is a really interesting um example to look at because in my mind there are really three types of labor politician right now the first type are, 
are, you know, those who, you know, I would consider careerists. Um, really, if we if we look at their voting behaviors, if we look at how they have um, spoken about our issues over many years, um, really, that's indistinguishable from many non-Muslim members of parliament. So here I'm thinking of people like Khalid Mahmoud or Sadiq Khan, you know, those who, you know, either were involved in at some point promoting the war in Iraq, have definitely promoted securitization of Muslims, uh, have refused to hold accountability for the ill-conceived ideas and policies of the Labour Party, you know, from the Tony Blair era. So with these careerists, we really hold no hope whatsoever. So there's a second there's a second category of Muslim politician, those who um, they they might want to do the right thing at times, but because of the way that Keir Starmer has structured the Labour Party, they don't want to fall foul of him. So Yasmin Qureshi, Shabana Mahmoud, Afsal Khan, uh, Naz Shah, you know, these are the types of politicians that you know, you can see at times you will see a glimmer of a desire to perhaps represent Muslim issues, but, you know, feel incapable of really responding to the system and the structure that, um, that Keir Starmer has created. And then I think that you have a, a finally a third category of Muslim politician in the Labour Party. And that's really um, the type that they want to do good. They've probably had a, a, a history of having pretty decent politics in, in regards to Muslim issues in the UK, maybe have a long history of activism. Um, but they, they seem incapable of thinking outside of electoral politics as a way of, uh, you know, kind of change making. So, you know, in this circumstance, you could probably say somebody like uh, Zara Sultana or Absana Begum kind of fit into that model. And, you know, recently, you know, with everything that we're seeing going on in Gaza, you have seen a number of councillors uh, leave their positions. They've resigned. And I think that's a really interesting moment. It's something that we can perhaps think about a little bit. But, you know, ultimately, if we're thinking about it from the perspective of um, ministers of parliament, I don't really hold much hope because of the way that the Labour Party itself has structured its politics. You know, at the end of the day, there's been kind of, especially since Corbyn left, an unabashed degree of Islamophobia, even directed towards the Muslim members of parliament without any accountability processes, but further an entrenching of an extremely pro-Zionist stance, which I think ultimately you know, really makes the position of these members of part, uh, parliament in that party in particular untenable. Because, you know, your leader is basically saying he doesn't give a, a monkeys about your belief system, about your, con your constituencies, about those that you claim to share a faith with. And so where does that leave you as a person when quite often the thing that you campaigned off of, which is, I am a Muslim, who's going to represent Muslim issues in parliament, um, you haven't been able to effectively do to the leader of your own party. Awesome. I suspect you and I have never really believed that uh, Muslims can assert their influence through uh, electoral politics. Uh, I certainly haven't believed, ever believed in the Labour Party or the Tories or uh, when Muslims in America said that we need to all vote for Biden because he said, inshallah, you know, I, I just found that to be deeply cynical and, and found them to be deeply immature when it comes to political matters. But there are Muslims who have been taken aback by just how Zionist and how pro-genocide Biden and Starmer and, you know, other left-leaning politicians around the world have, have been. Um, it's got to a point where they're, as you said quite rightly, they're deaf, dumb and blind to the Gazan cause. Should we feel surprised at how the left has betrayed the Muslim community? 
I mean, I'm not surprised at all. And also, I mean, I think we need to think a little bit about, you know, when we say the left, who we're talking about here, because really, mostly we're talking about um, liberals who wear the visage uh, of the left. So it's like an aesthetic for them. Keir Starmer is not the left by any stretch of the imagination. So what we're here, what we're really talking about are, are liberals. And liberals have never been friends to Muslims in any shape, form or manner. And we know this throughout the history of um, the black civil rights movement in the US and various civil rights movements around the world. Um, you know, even Martin Luther King called the white moderate, you know, extremely dangerous in terms of the struggle itself that they had. Yeah. And so when we, when we think about labor, we have to think of it in terms of a certain type of liberal politics, which effectively harms us in the long term. Because look, when it comes to the right, so the Tory party in particular, we know that there is this kind of like almost pathological dislike or disdain for Islam itself, um, unless it suits them on one particular issue or another. Now, liberals claim that they that they are unlike the Tories or um, those well, on the right. Open-minded, yeah, multicultural. But effectively, everything that they do becomes tantamount to the same thing. So they want you to be Muslim, but without any of the trappings of Islam. So almost like you you wear it as uh, like a hat or a or a cloak. Yeah, I'm a Muslim, but actually, if I profess any of my beliefs, then that becomes an issue. And so, yeah, I mean, am I surprised by what we have in relation to this Labour government in particular? I'm not surprised at all. Can I ask you about Muslim? Uh, representatives. We've got a fair share of Muslim representatives in the UK. And naively, I suspect some have surmised that m Muslims in Britain have done better than probably most other Muslims in Europe. And on some levels, we probably have. Um, but on this issue, it's been shocking in inverted commas that so many of those Muslim uh, representatives have been mute, they've been silent. I mean, Shabana Mahmood, you mentioned her. She's the uh, MP for Birmingham Ladywood. Uh, I think it ranks in the top five Labour Muslim, consti Muslim constituencies in the UK. Um, apart from writing a really weak letter to her constituents, which played the both sides' argument, uh, she has been silent. Now, Shabana Mahmood, after Sadiq Khan, is probably the, the most, at least in England, the most important uh, Labour member. She sits, she's the policy director of the Labour Party, uh, and will be behind the next uh, Labour electoral strategy and campaign. Uh, I suppose I'm asking, like, why have they remained so silent, at, you know, after such a prolonged few weeks of genocide? I mean, I, th I think they're, they're worried about being disciplined or cancelled by their own party leader in Keir Starmer. Um, I really think that that's uh, very much at the heart of why they took so long. You know, Shabana and Zara and, 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 you know, these politicians, they have a track record on Palestine that should have made it very easy for them to take a very strong ethical stance from day one. I mean, particularly Zara, because I know her work a little bit better. She's an MP for Coventry. That's think, correct. Yeah. yeah, Zara Sultana. It, it did take me by surprise how long it took for her to formulate a position uh, on, on this matter. And we have to ask ourselves why. Because ultimately, you know, like I said before, I think in their calculus, what they're thinking is that, you know, there are a whole host of issues that, you know, we want to we wanna be tackling. And so if we're not in that position, then how will we tackle those issues? But the question we also have to ask ourselves is, is that the end of politics? And I think that's, that's, that's really at the center of the conversation you and I are having, which uh -huh. is, is that it? Mm. Is this the start point and the end point of politics? Yeah. Or can we conceive of other kinds of politics, other forms of politics that allow us to be fully engaged 
in the societies that we live in, while at the same time holding on to our ethics as well. And this is the problem that I see with Muslim MPs, that they profess to insert themselves into the positions that they're in on the, on the promise of presenting the ethics of the Muslim community, but they never actually get, get there because they're always limited by what their parties allow because this, the party itself is a violent and oppressive structure. Even the whole whip process is something that is oppressive as a structure. It does not allow you the autonomy that you need. And of course, when you couple in the idea that for a lot of politicians, this is their career. I mean, you saw that really disgraceful interview that, that David Lammy did, where, you know, when he's asked to call out war crimes, his response is to say, I want to become foreign minister at some point in the future. How, how can you be so brazen as to place your own career aspirations over the death toll that we have seen so consistently every single day of this latest aggression by the Israelis, this genocide by the Israelis. And so that's what we're left with, really, um, a kind of weak, tepid, and I would even say kind of a, a politics of cupidity um, that has unfortunately become normalized amongst uh, a lot of these politicians. So that's interesting. Yeah, I, I want to dig a bit deeper there because you've, you've raised some really interesting points about the structural forces that in a way limit even sincere-minded people. I mean, I've got no doubt that some of these politicians went into politics with aims and objectives. They were probably quite sincere. Um, I remember meeting Sadiq Khan and, you know, uh, he asked me to, to help him or endorse him for when he wanted to become an MP. And I remember saying to him that, well, I don't think you know, being an MP in a Labour Party, this was post-Iraq war, is really going to be beneficial for, for Muslims. And, you know, he scoffed and said, well, unless you're at the top table, you're never going to be able to, or at the table, you're never going to be able to represent the Muslim community. In a way, I'm doing this for you. How dare you, you know, you question me. But even David Lammy, I, in a, I, I remember having a comment. So David Lammy as, is, is a black a politician from Tottenham, one of the most deprived areas in London. I remember once I um, I was in a car with David Lammy. It's a long story. And uh, he was telling me how I'm Britain... I'm going to start turning this on you now, <laughs> like looking at your uh, politics. Uh... Sorry. He was telling me that Britain is structurally uh, extremely uh, racist. Like he believed that there is a structural racism in Britain. And his point was, I'm, I'm, I'm on this you know, uh, objective on this goal, on this agenda to get rid of his structural racism, which is a great, you know, a great assessment, I think, to, to make. Yet, here we got, you know, a future foreign secretary who's in effect um, saying that white settler colonialism is perfectly acceptable in, this, in, in Israel. So back to the question, explain these structural forces that, that hem in even sincere people and make them into hypocrites, really. So there is a, a window uh, that liberalism permits for anyone to operate inside of. It sets the tone for every single piece of output that you produce. If you step outside of that window of what it permits, then effectively you become a pariah. Go too far one way, go too far the other, and you are then outside of what liberalism constitutes as goodness. And, the, and so that relates to everything. That relates to how it conceives of, say, anti-Semitism. It relates to how it con conceives of, of racism, of Islamophobia, anything, right? So Islamophobia within that window looks like this. It's about uh, a hijabi having a hijab pulled off in the street or, a, you know, a Muslim family being attacked on a bus. So liberalism within the public domain reduces Islamophobia to its most narrow possible conception. Whereas anti-Semitism within this liberal paradigm is expanded to its widest possible conception. 
So for example, if you're Aisha Jung and uh, you hold up a placard at a protest uh, amongst many other people and you refer to, your placard refers to apartheid Israel as being a, a country as satire with the word, with the letter O removed from country, you know, without expanding too much more, as a satirical device, yes. that is not permitted. Right. Because that is seen as uh, something that goes beyond the pale of what liberalism will permit. Mm. So the same people that will champion a certain type of freedom of expression yeah. will limit that. But of course, when it comes to Islamophobia, what is considered to be uh, appropriate in the way that you speak about Muslims is expanded massively. And so um, the Sun, the Daily Mail, they can say whatever they want and there's almost zero repercussion on them because they have set the parameters for what goodness is. And so there is a licensed dissent, okay? Your, if you dissent from anything that is constructed within those narratives, it has to be almost like approved within their own vernacular, which is where a lot of the violence takes place. And so a lot of these MPs, they are forced to operate within those boundaries. To operate outside of them turns them into, say, for example, Jeremy Corbyn, who, of course, you know, for us, many Muslims was problematic for other reasons. You know, his refusal to, to acknowledge that Assad was gassing Syrians, for example, um, you know, kind of left a very, very bitter taste in our, in our mouths in relation to whether or not it's possible for anyone to be truly ethical. He might have been a great on a whole range of issues, including Palestine, including Islamophobia, but we're, we're also not people who are willing to throw uh, all of our Syrian brothers and sisters under the bus for the sake of having whatever little handouts Corbyn was willing to provide because he was the best of a very, very bad bunch. And so there are so many things at play, and this doesn't even come to kind of bring in all the different types of industrial complexes that that really do manage what our countries are like, you know, who are the main players. So it's, it's, it's complicated, but I think if we just use that window of liberalism as our frame, we can kind of see how everything is managed carefully. You're a South Londoner, Asim. Tell me about Sadiq. Very proud. <laughs> Tell me about Sadiq Khan. What went wrong? I mean, you know, uh, I said it right at the, the very beginning. I see Sadiq Khan as a, as a careerist, as somebody who has always had one eye on how to further his career in various ways. So, you know, first when he became an MP, I mean, like you, I remember him going from mosque to mosque, promising that he would be representing Muslims, that his being elected was really the key to Muslim representation in the UK. He would, you know, kind of talk all the right language. He'd use all the right phrases from kind of an Islamic perspective. Um, but ultimately, really, if we were to analyze from let's say 2001, the beginning of the global war on terror up until this date, if just a, we did a cost benefit analysis of Muslim MPs and representation on Muslim issues, right? What has it actually got us? I would say very little. We have I mean, Eid in Trafalgar Square, I think. We have Eid in Trafalgar Square and yeah. we have iftars at the Downing, at Downing, 10 Downing Street. Um, but other than that, it did definitely did get us a, a war in Afghanistan. It got us a war in Iraq. It got us some of the most oppressive counter-terrorism legislation across the entire world, including a prevent strategy that was sold and exported around the world, including to China. So what the Uyghur have been facing in terms of their cultural genocide was taught to the Chinese by the British prevent policy. That is all stained, uh, that, all of that blood is, is staining the hands of British politicians, British Muslim politicians, who refuse to hold any of their leaders to account, whether it's Tony Blair, um, David Cameron, Theresa May, I mean, Gordon Brown even before that, right? You know, up until this contemporary moment with Rishi Sunak. 
and of course their own party leaders, even though he's in opposition with Keir Starmer. You know, and so really, what have we what have we got out of all of the out of all of these years of representation? I think we've got far much more out of Muslim civil society than we've ever uh, received from Muslim members of parliament. I do want to explore the civil society point in a second, but isn't there an argument to suggest that young people in particular, a young child growing up in multicultural Britain, the more they see representatives that look and feel like them, the more they're going to be inspired to become, you know, wherever it may be, lawyers or engineers or politicians. So there's a net benefit just from a a raw representative perspective. If our representation is devoid of our ethics, then are we still being represented? And I think that's really the key here. Um, I think people are far more inspired by uh, MMA fighters like Khabib Nurmagomedov, mm. right? Than they are by, say, for example, a Muslim politician. Um, I'm not saying that MMA is perfect or anything. That's not my that's not my intention in making that example. But what I'm saying is that people often appreciate those who are able to represent the ethics of what they believe in much more so than um, just the simple mere fact of them being there. Right. You know, we can be represented in many, many different ways. The virtue of our presence in that system does not mean our success. And the Quran speaks to this ex explicitly in Surah Ghafir when we're given the example of Qarun. So what is it about Qarun? Qarun is from Bani Israel, right? He's from the oppressed class of society, directly oppressed by the Pharaoh. He is from the family of Musa alayhi salam. Ibn Abbas says that he's his paternal cousin, right? That's how close they are in their relationship to one another. Now, the, uh, the verses about Arun, they talk about how impressive he is. You know, he's, he's kind of given a position of authority by Fir'aun. You know, he's got so much wealth and people are like, wow, this guy has really made it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Qarun that Qarun betrayed his own people, that his representation within the system is actually a detriment to who? To himself. And it's it's actually scary when you think about it that somebody from the oppressed caste of, of, of society could be so condemned by Allah. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the condemnation of Fir'aun, he mentions three names. Fir'aun's name, Haman's name, who is his chief minister, and Qarun's. All the other ministers are just referred to as Malayin. All of the soldiers are just referred to as Junud. But Qarun's mentioned by name. That is the depth of his betrayal. And so what we learn from this moment in the Quran, one of the thing, lessons that we can try and take away from it is, is it enough to be successful within a system of injustice? Or does it carry implications for us in terms of our akhirah? And I think... A lot of young people, they see the contradictions in, in that representation. They don't want a, 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 a representation that is devoid of ethics and of strength and of courage and a sense of izza, a sense of honor. They want a representation that is, that is filled with our, our political demands and our political needs and our aspirations and our desire to rectify the world that we live in. There is a, a discussion that it's a perennial discussion I see out there about how the Zionists have managed to infiltrate the system and managed to, uh, through their lobbying power, have managed to subvert foreign policy uh, to accommodate the state of Israel. And the discussion goes that Muslims probably have to do something quite similar. Now, uh, one can debate uh, the ethics, one has to debate the ethics of that, of that approach, but one can't deny that it's been deeply successful. I mean, you know, think about the American state and how there's a bipartisan acceptance of the state of Israel, even after the deaths of three, 4,000 children. Um, um, is there something to learn from the Zionist lobby, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, you know, there, um, 
their approach was born in, of course, so much violence. Um, you know, the Holocaust was something that is that is said intergenerationally, not just uh, in terms of their imagination and kind of the, the passing down of stories, but even in their day, DNA. There's so many studies about um, epigenetics and the way that trauma um, <coughs> it transfers through through the genes to a, a following generation and further generations after that. And so we can understand in some ways why they got so well organized. I think that part of the problem for Muslim communities is that because our um, political ambitions have been so limited, we've never mobilized into a movement of any such. And I don't think that we have to just take one community and just take their example as being like the be all, be all and end all. Um, I would ra ra much rather be a community that was completely unsuccessful from a worldly perspective but held on to its central ethics, then be represented at every single sphere of life and be devoid of the very tawheed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, that has blessed us with. So the two things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Maybe we could be represented with a very, very high degree of our own ethics intact. But my point is to really say that the, our emphasis should always be on maintaining our integrity in whatever situation we're in. And so if we are looking at other movements, whether it's the black civil rights movement or it's the way in which um, kind of uh, Zionist lobbies have managed to um, interact with various institutions and make their case known and make their case heard. And you, I mean, you can't really uh, begrudge a people who want to make the interests of their people above anybody else, right? That's their business. We have our own business, but we haven't mobilized effectively in order to advocate for ourselves. Because of course, you know, we are uh, busy fighting amongst ourselves for whatever scraps that we're given. That is an unfortunate part of Muslim political life. But it's also that we haven't actually developed a sense of our own um, ethics in that approach. That, you know, we can be strong in what we believe in. That, you know, we, we don't have to constantly um, narrate ourselves according to our concerns about what a white majority population might conceive of us. So you hear that a lot, right, in, in various different circumstances, you know, which is, you know, oh, you know, we should frame it that way or this way in order to make it more palatable to others. Do you not care about making your message palatable to the majority? No. Uh, it's not something I'm personally invested or interested in. I want people to treat me based on my ideas on, on, on the terms that I'm trying to set for myself. That might make people uncomfortable, but if they can see the fact that I'm respectful in the way that I do it, and inshallah, I hope that people find us as Muslims always, you know, those who are, are willing to respect others, to listen, to learn, but to also exchange, then in that is a sense of uh, honor and dignity about ourselves. Right. Uh, I remember I wrote a report. Um, it was the, the first time that anybody had looked at the science that sits behind prevent. Um, alhamdulillah, by Allah's fadl, we managed to, to find it. It was something that was being hidden uh, from public view. We managed to find a, a methodology paper, even though the actual study itself was hidden. So we analyzed the methodology paper. We sent it past 19 different experts across disciplines who helped to verify the, the kind of veracity of our research. And it was a big deal. And I remember the night before we released it, we thought, okay, this report is such a big deal because it's exposing how utterly racist the government's prevent program and strategy is. We should bring the major Muslim organizations in the UK along to present it to them so they're not so that they are prepared to talk about it when we release it the following day. And so we did that. The 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 most important Muslim organization sent their you know, in terms of a representation perspective, sent their uh, vice um, chairperson, vice secretary, 
to to our meeting. Yeah. He listened to everything, whatever else. He was the first person to speak after we finished our presentation. He said, this is possibly one of the most important contributions that has ever been made by you know Muslims in the UK because it really under, undermines everything that the government's doing so far. And then he said, and honestly, this broke my heart. He said, don't you think it would have been better if you had had a white academic front the report? And this organization... It, it pretends to present the Muslim community in an equal citizenry to everyone else, that we are the same as all of you. We're, we're on the same terms. You know, everything's fine. We're, we're just as British as everybody else and whatever else. A cage, like, we don't care for that narrative. We'll say it as it is, which is there is a two-tier system in this country. We are treated like second-class citizens because the law and policy have been constructed to treat us like second class citizens, right? So I know that as a material fact, you pretend like that doesn't exist. We are not starting from the same position, but the difference is you pretend that it doesn't exist, but still internalize the two tier system. I know the two tier system exists, but I don't give a monkeys about it because I will still act and behave in a way that does not l allow myself to feel less than anyone else. And that is the difference. For those of us in cage, there is no cognitive dissonance between what we understand about the world and what we see about ourselves. And for so many of these Muslim organizations and so many of these Muslim members of parliament, they know that that two-tier two system exists but they have to pretend like it doesn't in order to not make other people feel uncomfortable about the very nature of that existence. And that is the lie that young people see through. That is why representation politics doesn't work because young people are not stupid. They can see through this facade that has been created by unfortunately many Muslim representation organizations that is not true to the reality of their daily existence. They can see that Ukraine has spoken about differently to Palestine, that Muslims, that Islamophobia is speaking, spoken about differently to anti-Semitism, that within these structures of power, there are all sorts of two tiers at different levels that operate in different ways. But at least I can say with my hand on my heart that we don't hide that material fact from anybody. What we do is that we encourage people to feel empowered through it. That don't treat yourself less than. If even if they're going to, even if they're going to construct an entire system of laws, at least in your heart, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that gave you life and gave you izza for yourself. So that's interesting. I mean, do you see that, do you have some room for optimism when thinking about how young people in particular are, be, are seeing through this facade, you know, um, you talk about these representative organizations, many of them are probably one can, argue, one can suggest they're full of older, the older generation who may have a deference towards or, uh, the West and towards the British. And, and some of that may be, you know, may be a legacy from colonialism. You know, one can, one can think about that, but, uh, young people tend to be less enamored by uh, these superficial uh, systems and, and are more open to pointing out the contradictions that exist in, in, the, um, uh, in, in the political space. I mean, are you optimistic about young people? Absolutely. I mean, honestly, um, seeing the, um, the difference in activism on the streets of the UK since 2001, you know, when many of us kind of Came of age, and, right? Yeah, I mean, we had to, right? 9-11 was such a stark moment for us because all overnight, the already other rising that we felt from like an everyday racism perspective got propelled into a Muslims in particular kind of lens, right? The spotlight was, was squarely on us. And so everything that we already felt got magnified manifold times. And, you know, I remember being a young activist in, in university and 
almost feeling suffocated all the time. Um, I remember when we started our work at Cage, no message permitting us into the mosque to talk about Guantanamo Bay, about why it was such a terrible thing and about due process and rights and just basic, basic ideas about how Islam itself requires a response from Muslims that is connected to the space of justice and of rights. Um, and that didn't exist in those days. Like we were still seen as French and pariah. But now, mashallah, we have got a whole generation who are looking at the world and realizing that there is something wrong. We have so many young activists who are doing environmental activism. They care about Allah's earth from a spiritual sense. They're connected to it spiritually. They say that, you know, part of our deen is to take care of this earth itself. And so invo involving themselves in that kind of activism. You've got anti-racism activists who are looking at the Quran, reading the Quran and reading into it, you know, the fact that, you know, Iblis says, Ana khayru minhu, you know, like, you know, I'm better than him. And reading that as like the, the genesis of a very, very racist argument and understanding that we have obligations towards ending racism. So you have like this whole proliferation of young activism. The problem is, is that, you know, I believe that a lot of our traditional institutions attempt to mollify and pacify them, pacify that energy in, and channel it back into representation politics as the only means by which real change can be affected rather than challenging that young energy into building a mass mobilized movement of Muslims. And I'm not just talking about voting as a bloc, because I think you and I both know that voting as a bloc for a start is structurally difficult in the UK because of the way that our political um, electoral system is structured. Maybe um, in one or two places, you might be able to do that. Maybe you can unseat an MP, but largely it's very, very difficult to do. But is there another politics outside that? I know you want to speak about that later. And so, you know, when we no, get about... No, why don't we... But let's, let's talk about it now. What is the alternative? If your suggestion is that, or your, you assert that electoral politics tends to not work and Muslims are never going to find a solution, an answer within the party political system, especially in these sorts of countries like the US and Britain, where the system is extremely closed and you've got these two parties that are basically the same. Uh, what alternatives do we have available to us? So, so here's the thing: in 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 our schema at Cage, you know how we conceive of what success looks like. Success for us has nothing to do with the material world, and I think that a lot of Muslim organizations and entities forget that they don't they don't even incorporate that into their own personal organizational identity that success is not something that you can touch in a material sense because even say for example you're materially successful what was the state of your heart like what were your ethics like in the process of gaining that thing maybe the thing that you gained is a thing that leads you into the hellfire right so we for to, to start with have to restructure from the perspective of our own belief system, the very notion of what success looks like, because time and time and time and time and time again in the Quran, we're told the same thing, that those who are successful aren't the ones who necessarily win in the material world. That, And I'm not saying that this is a, um, a pessimistic view of the world. We still have an obligation because the prophets, every single prophet was, was brought really did two things at the same time. They brought a message of Tawheed, which is what something that we all must be doing all the time. Sometimes activists forget that. They forget that in the in the course of their anti-racism work or in the course of their work against Islamophobia, they forget they actually have obligations to speak about this religion as well, that they have to promote um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, that Prophet is the last and final messenger, and that Islam has solutions for life. But so Tawheed is one message, but the prophets also brought this message of so, social rectification that if you're like, for example, Shu'aib who I think is probably the most profound story in terms of this 
secularism that takes place between these disparate spaces. It's his people, the sin that they're punished for, is ultimately saying, what has your prayer got to do with the marketplace? Right? And Shaib is saying the two are, alayhi salam, are inextricably linked to one another. That actually, you cannot pray adequately unless your dealings in the marketplace are adequate as an act of ta'abud, as an act of worshipping Allah. And so we as well, actually, as Muslim organizations have created this kind of religious secularism, which is, you know, the idea that you pray, you do all your rituals and whatever else. And then there is the space of politics that exists outside of that. And we forget that all of these areas for a Muslim are inextricably linked. They, they cannot be separated from one another. And so the very, very like kind of meta assessment of what change making looks like has to be that reframing that success for us has to be situated in the place of ethics that we hold on to our values, that we are ethical on this earth. Now, after that, we believe that, yes, people can get involved in representation politics and whatever else. Sure, why not? In fact, actually, in, in Surah Ghafir, again, you have the mirror image of Qarun is the secret believer who's from the family of Fir'aun, and he uses position in a, in a system of oppression to save Musa alayhi salam's life, to do something good from that position. So it's possible to get inside the system and do something good. The Quran presents that idea. It's very difficult though, because the structure, the overall structure is still oppressive. And so that person has a very, very tough job. They have to have a very clean heart and a very tough job. But for us, always the power is in mobilizing people. And that is the alternative politics we need at this time. If like all the Muslim organizations in the quietness of their rooms recognize that we live in a two-tier system, that the playing field is not level for us, that we as brown people who come from countries that are not from here can have our citizenships removed, that there is already embedded in the law the idea that we are not actually ever fully from here. In order to stop that from going even further, in order to be able to advocate for all of our issues, we do need people to be able to mobilize and activate in order to carry out acts of civil disobedience in this country if need be, to take sacrifices, to inform people that we will make the institution of this country, their life very, very hard by shutting down weapons, factories like Elbit Systems, like Palestine Action are doing, because we take our rights very, very seriously. And we will not limit ourselves to a liberal frame of what respectability politics looks like. And that is a problem, that we have not reached the level of a mobilized community. People often say to those of us at CAGE that you guys are like Malcolm X and the MCB are like Martin Luther King. It's such a poor reading of history because honestly, if CAGE had reached the level of Martin Luther King, I would be over the moon. If we had even reached that level, forget about Malcolm X, that's like an aspiration that is like still beyond us. But even to the level of Martin Luther King who was able to mobilize so many people who was willing to go to prison for his beliefs, right? That would be amazing for me to have that in the UK. You know, what we're talking about is far more tepid in terms of the activism scene in the UK. You know, the MCB is not the equivalent to Martin Luther King. I'm sorry to say it, if they, and if anybody holds that view, then they have not read their own history. So the MCB is the Muslim Council of Britain. Now, they're not here to defend themselves, but what's your take as you've raised them? Why do you present, what's the problem you have with MCB? So the MCB it claims to represent affiliates, mm. uh, organizations around mosques the UK, and mosques yeah. and community centers and right. community organizations. All they have to do is sign up to the Muslim Council of Britain. And yeah they ostensibly are supposed to operate in a way that tries to represent the interests of these uh, affiliates. To politicians. To politicians, to, right. to various institutions around the UK. Yeah. Um, so far, at least in the time period that I've been an activist, I have never seen an action taken by the MCB that I felt really, really represented the interests of the community at large that represented our ethics. 
often what I find with the organization is a kind of a watering down, uh, a two sidesing of any kind of situation. So whether it's securitization, where they'll say, well, you know, in their documents, they'll write, well, you know, the government has a responsibility to keep this country safe and therefore it requires um, various powers in order to be able to do that. It makes these statements as a um, as a bone that it can throw the government to say, hey, look, we get it from your perspective. We're a legitimate organization. Yeah, we're willing to see all right. sides. But on, on Gaza, what has the MCB done on Gaza? Uh, on Gaza, they released an 11 page document um, helping Muslims to understand how they can do their advocacy for um for uh, palestine for gaza in particular right now so it's it's an, it's a fascinating document because when you read through it for 11 pages they don't mention the, the name israel once as if gazans are being genocided by a phantom killer that <laughs> this this kind of kind of malevolent force that's taking their lives but nobody knows who this malevolent force actually is but really, I think the main problem with the document is something that um, the uh, the Muslim psychologist Tariq Yunus, um, you know, kind of talked about on his Twitter account, which is that they reduce the solution to interfaith dialogue. No one, I don't think anyone so far has said that the 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 problem in Palestine is between Muslims and Jews or Muslims, Christians and Jews. I don't think anyone has said that. Not that I know of, at least anyway. I think we've all consistently said that the problem for a hundred years has been a settler, colonial, apartheid, racist, Zionist state. I think consistently Palestinians have said that. I think consistently Palestinians have said this is not a religious conflict. And yet the MCB's grand solution in its advocacy, and remember, this is supposed to provide advice to Muslim affiliates that are signed up to it, is that we should have more interfaith dialogue between the religions. This was, and you know, Tariq makes good, a very good point, Dr. Tariq Yunus, which is, it might even be anti-Semitic to say that because there are plenty of anti-Zionist Jews who are involved in this conversation yeah. as well. Bravely. You know, bravely, we've seen some absolutely. Amazing demonstrations, Abs haven't we? You know, absolutely yeah. bravely. And so where does that leave them then? And so I think that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, an organization like the MCB um, has pretty much run its course because that type of politics that where we have leaders who ostensibly represent us in, you know, to the British military or to parliament or to whoever, like, why do we need that? When actually in this day and age with social media, uh, with the kind of access that we have to write, to talk, to speak, to produce content, we can access those powers out all the time ourselves and more directly relate what our issues are, as opposed to requiring these gatekeepers. I think the time for gatekeepers is over. You know, and I think young people are very much showing us the way in that regard. Fantastic. Um, talking about a young organization, there is a, 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 a new organization, the Muslim Census, and they did a survey of 30,000 Muslims in the UK and asked whether um, uh, they would, what, what their voting intentions were. And I think only 5% said they would vote Labour. Now, in 2019, um, the polling suggested that 71% uh, of Muslims in Britain voted Labour or intended to vote Labour in that election. Um, so, you know, we have got a very strong groundswell of opinion against Labour. Now, what I've come across, and it's an odd uh, response, but, you know, there is a sub there's a substantial number of people who still argue this, uh, is in the British context, if you desert the Labour Party, then you've got Suala Braverman, you've got the Conservatives, and they are evil, you know, beyond bounds. Or in the American context, you know, I think it's a very similar thing. Muslims have generally supported the Democrats since 9-11. Um, 
Well, the argument goes, if you desert the Democrats or you work, vote for even a third party candidate, or you don't vote at all, then the Republicans will come in and, and you know, they are evil. Right. right. Um, so the argument is the right is our greatest enemy. And so we've got to hold our noses and vote for the left or the liberal left in order for us to get some form of, I don't know, sane politics in this country. I can see you don't like every <laughs> syllable of what I've said there. It's a false binary. Um, you know, I think I think if we're going to talk about America, America's a very good um, example of how that false binary takes place. You know, whether it's Democrats who are dropping the bombs or it's Republicans that are dropping the bombs, the bombs still get dropped. Um, now, the Biden administration or Obama administration, you know, two presidents ago, might s drop those bombs with a smile on their face, inviting you to the White House to have iftar and to hold Eid parties and so on and so forth, and not openly um, demonize you. But it's tantamount to the same thing when you feel the effects of it in your life in the same way. The Obama administration who expanded the drone program in Yemen, Somalia, and in Afghanistan to a degree that had never been seen before in the Bush administration. The same Obama administration that refused to hold torturers to account, choosing to protect them instead. And a whole litany of other Islamophobic policies. The Biden administration right now, who literally is 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 rolling its foreign policy out over the mass graves of Gaza and children. I don't see how this in any way, shape or form allows us to conceive of a lesser of two evils argument. And the same thing really applies with the Labour Party now in relation to the Conservatives, which is, is Keir Starmer really that much different than um, anybody in the Tory party. You know, he wants to be tough on crime. He's already expressed lots of Islamophobic sentiment already within his party, treating his own party members with absolute disdain, has literally gone on the radio calling, um, a kind of okaying a war crime in the context of uh, taking away the electricity and water from Gazans and saying that's absolutely fine. Um, so what is it that we're looking for from these people? Because really they tan that it's tantamount to the same thing. And so I think that we need to see that there are, there are ways of mobilizing outside of this, that putting our political stock in, in these two parties in particular is not the be all and end all of our politics that actually we could we could say we're not engaging in this and still live a political life and still be able to mobilize and still be able to make an impact on the way in which they conceive of us. The ballot box is not the be all and end all, right? Especially if that ballot box uh, you know kind of results in the way that I choose how I am oppressed. So do I get oppressed with somebody who clearly hates me openly or do I get oppressed by somebody who smiles at me but then enacts policies that have the same impact on my life than the guy who hated me openly, right? Like it's, it's, it's a complete false binary. Yeah. And so I think especially with the situation in Gaza, what we've seen is that how Muslims have absolutely no political stake whatsoever because... And here's the reality that we have to come to grips with. We serve much more as a political tool for these parties as a community that should be demonized to a sentiment within a certain class of society that hates us to appeal to their votes rather than to appealing to us directly. So we're much more of a political tool in that regard. We don't say, we don't 
we 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 serve a much greater purpose in um in being demonized than we do being pandered to and that's just a reality of the politics right now ironically of course the very people that they're trying to pander to are historically and to this day racists and anti-semites um uh Lars Bernson he has a very good book Eric Lars Bernson called um The Liberal Roots of Far Right Activism where he shows that all of these far right groups that they are constantly being pandered to by the Starmer Labour and also by the Tories their their roots are in homophobia and in anti-semitism but they've adopted those causes in the contemporary moment for one purpose only which is to hate on islam and so this is where there is a convergence between all of these different interest groups right so labor would much rather tap into that by not seeing to be too close to muslims uh, and gaining those votes then to show any in publicly that we think that muslims should be defended i mean it's it's clear that the labor party require um working class votes that they lost in 2019 the so called red war as well as uh, conservative seats down south and as you said those demographics they tick the boxes of of those people who've got uh, antagonisms towards islam and uh, and so you you probably right i i i suspect you're arguing that Keir Starmer actually relishes the fact that he's taken this hard line on gaza and that he's alienating the muslim community uh because there's a greater gain to be made amongst these white in inverted commas racist voters um can i can i ask you about you've raised the us context there and um before gaza came along there were a whole series of real social issues that we were very concerned with especially in terms of our kids at school you know the trans agenda and and the rest of it and um i've heard now from a number of us muslims that um we can't change them on foreign policy so let's not try to do that but when it comes to just social issues the republicans are better they've got a tougher line on abortion they've got a tougher line on trans rights they've got a tougher line on drugs and you know it's it's the republican states that have banned uh, these drugs whereas in california the smell is everywhere right um so they've come to a conclusion i think rather naively but i would like to get your take on this that um uh we probably need to flip now to the right and to the republicans i mean how would you respond to that i mean I, you took the word right out of my mouth which was not the word naive um you're going to you're going to go to somebody um that has told you explicitly so many times over decades they cannot stand the sight of you being alive let alone living amongst them in their country that you are a political hope because you hate gay people and transgender people and this is my point right that we're always looking for a sanctuary in somebody else's narratives in somebody else's power that somehow those who hold power are the be all and end all of our politics rather than simply saying we hold our own values on our terms based on our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that regardless of what you think of us that we have enough sense of honor in ourselves that we have enough sense of honor in our faith that we don't have to hide it from anyone that we don't have to re- we don't require anybody else to tell us that this is the right thing or the wrong thing to do that we are not and but also that we're not going to simply hold hands with you because we agree with you on one issue while you drop bombs on the head of our children elsewhere in the world and and it's this kind of i think this happens more in america than anywhere else really which is this american exceptionalism muslim exceptionalism that somehow anybody actually gives a monkeys about the long term project of american islam or british islam or anywhere in europe the vast majority of the ummah lives outside of these countries we are not so special that we require a particular concession that we get to ma- act against our own ethics for the sake of our longevity 
I'm sorry, but that's that's a, that's a level of uh, self conceitedness that um, that's not only naive. I think that's antithetical to the interests of developing an ummah consciousness, of an ummah we approach to all of our issues. What who are we going to throw under the bus for the sake of our own longevity? And you know, some people will say, "Well, that's too idealistic." We've never tried idealism. We've been so pragmatic for so long that we've literally dug ourselves into a hole where we cannot even be fully Muslim without somebody else's permission. Perhaps what we need at this time is a degree of idealism that we've never had before. An idealism that actually allows Muslims to feel a sense of honor about who they are and how they belong. What about the notion that if we cut ourselves off from the political system, we're going to be disenfranchised, we're going to be marginalized as a community. And as a result, yes, we've had the anti-terrorism laws. Yes, we've had prevent and the various uh, bits of legislation. I'm in a way answering my own question. Yes, here, sorry, but, like, you know, could it get worse? Could it get yeah. any worse? Um, well, it has been getting progressively worse. Yes. Has all of that representation that we had moved the dial in a way that we can say, oh, things are looking up for us. No, because they haven't repealed any of the legislation that they had before. They just kept on bringing in. We had the Eid lights in Piccadilly Circus. I think, oh, I mean, so. that was amazing. I mean, I'm literally willing to like, you know, forgive all of the people that I've seen abused, you know, kind of all of the, the mothers and fathers who had their children taken away or the people who've had their citizenships removed. I know you, you don't hold that view, but yeah, like, you know, The question we have to ask ourselves is, at what cost do we get those things, right? Like, yeah, no doubt. It is nice to see Eid lights up in Piccadilly Circus. Like, it's amazing. You were in, you know, the 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 colonial metropole, okay, in London, um, and you walk down Piccadilly Circus, and I saw them. And they look very pretty. It was an incredible thing to 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 look at, and a bizarre thing because you're in central London and looking at this thing where normally you would see like snow angel uh, angels and whatever else at Christmas time and whatever have you and like kind of frosty things and whatever. And there you had Eid lights instead. So it is a remarkable thing, but is that used? as a way of disempowering us and giving us a false sense of our own impact in this country? Do we then forget about um, the the families who are suffering every single day because of Islamophobic policies? Do we forget about the people who are being referred to prevent? Like at what cost? And even if it was only happening to one person, should not that one act of oppression be enough for everyone to drop what they're doing and say, what the heck is going on here? How is it that we are allowing one person, one Muslim, to be oppressed in the way that they are? But we get so caught up in moving from one thing to the next that we forget that there are people suffering every single day. And our our religion has taught us that it is the oppressed that we should be putting first. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, it's an amazing hadith and one that has really sat at the center of most of my work, my, my most of my working life, which is that he's he's performing tawaf around the Kaaba. So he's 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 going doing his circles around it and he stops. And he looks at the Kaaba and he starts speaking to it. And he says, Oh, how beautiful you are. And then he says to the Kaaba that know this, that not you nor the environs that surround you, talking of the city of Mecca itself, are worth the sanctity of a single Muslim. This hadith is so profound because it sets up for us a sliding scale of importance of what it means to be a Muslim. That that something that's a ritual, like Umrah, or even performing Hajj, maybe, or visiting the house of Allah in Mecca, that Mecca itself, a blessed land where your prayers are worth so much more than they are um, anywhere else. That it is not worth 
that whole setup is not worth the sanctity of a Muslim. And yet the sanctity of Muslims are being defiled every single day while we live in this country. But yet we get happy at Eid lights as if somehow those Eid lights make up for people who are crying and not just here in Gaza because of what we are allowing to happen here. And so we have to ask ourselves quite the question of what does that representation look like? But more importantly, what do our politics look like? And our politics can now, going forward, not simply be reduced to party representation or gatekeeping representation. We have to be done with that completely. We need to have many more young people involved. We need that for them to be leading the charge on mobilizing, on taking risks, on holding institutions to account, on saying that we are not here on anyone else's terms but our own. And we will not allow a party like the Labour Party to disempower us by boxing our issues into some promise in the future. Uh, oh, if you vote for me, we'll take care of you in the long run, but let's just get into power first. We're not waiting for that. We want, we want that right now, right this second. We want Gazans to be free of the shelling right this second, not at some promise in the future. And so that's where I think this community really that we together need to mature together and to grow up together and envisage a different world of politics together, inshallah. One final question, uh, Dr. Asim Qureshi. We started this conversation uh, talking about the deep anger that's felt over what's happening in Gaza. Um, and uh, I've been, um, it's been wonderful to see how many Muslims have realized that we've got to do something, we've got to, on so many levels, we are deficient uh, in terms of our political activism and we have to change our ways and we have to organize. How do you think we can organize in a systematic way to not just deal with the next Gaza, to deal with the next atrocity, but actually to change the system so that the system works in our favor? So, Zakhlach Khan for that, for this question in particular. Um, for a start, I think we need to do ta'awun ala bir wa taqwa. So to cooperate with one another on uh, on righteousness, on goodness, and on a consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Muslims. Our house, the edifice of the ummah. So when I talk about our house, I'm not just talking about us in the UK. I'm talking about all of us. It is on fire all over the, the world. And we are busy having debates around things like the Mawlid. Doing that, having a debate on the Mawlid in this time, in this age, is akin to being inside that house, walking down the stairs as you're leaving and seeing that a picture is askew and spending time trying to, to write it. We cannot afford to be like that anymore. We, these debates, these discussions, when inshallah there is justice on the earth and we have reestablished ourselves as people who are committed to righteousness and committed to working with one another and there is justice for people on the streets every single day, then inshallah we can sit down and we can debate until the late hours of every morning with one another about whether or not the mawlid is something that's permissible in Islam. Until that is, until that moment comes, I am uninterested in this current moment by those types of debates. And if we are having them, it shows that there is a deficiency in understanding the moment that we are in. We have to find ways of organizing alongside one another. But more so than anything else, we must be very, very strict about anyone who puts something out into the public domain that puts their own safety and longevity above another Muslim's cause elsewhere. 
They don't want to save their mosques or their organizations or themselves. Right. Right. So if they take a position because they feel like their project is important, but that comes at the detriment of other Muslims. Say, for example, say we're going to take prevent funding because we don't want to seem like extremists, right? And we want to make sure that our mosque project is in a continuity that it carries on. Then this has to be seen as khiana, as a form of treachery and betrayal of the interests of the community at large. Well, we've seen some of that over Gaza, right? We've seen some people argue that uh, the resistance uh, brought it on themselves and uh, this is all part of, you know, um, our own internal failure. Right. And so that has to stop this kind of dividedness amongst us and the whole idea that of self-preservation. Honestly, alhamdulillah, if we have yaqeen and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then this religion has already been preserved. This religion does not rise or fall on the basis of our actions. We rise and fall on the basis of our own actions, not the religion itself. The religion is protected and the hidayah of every single person is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who's going to grant it. Your little project in Dudley is not going to... Uh, save the religion itself trust me it's not inshallah this religion will survive regardless of whether or not we do right and so we have to internalize that within our institutional structures we have to internalize the idea that cooperating with one another of um you know holding hands with one another on the issues that affect the ummah is the priority above all else right now. So we've got to build networks. We've got to organize ourselves and get mm -hmm. people to to work in one direction. Absolutely. And yeah. and I and I feel that is the most important work that that any Muslim organization can do right now. You know, especially, you know, with elections coming up, if if this work happens and people are able to see that oh wow those organizations that were theologically divided amongst one another, they're actually cooperating. They're doing joint events together. They're talking about Islamophobia together. They're talking about Gaza together. They're doing all of this stuff together. Yeah. The cumulative effect of that will be inspiring for Muslims because they'll see that, oh my God, if our leaders and our organizations and our institutions are able to put everything aside for the sake mm. of a much larger cause, then inshallah, it will inspire them to understand that mobilization is possible. But we have to have the maturity to get to that point. We have to have the maturity to say, you know what, I don't need to take the lead on this. I'm going to go to that masjid. I'm going to say, I'm supporting you. You have your speakers. You have your programs. We don't even need a speaker. Mm -hmm. We just want to put our name next to yours to say that we support you, that we want to do something for Gaza together, that we yeah. want to send a message to Keir Starmer and to his entire cabinet, and to Rishi Sunak and his entire cabinet, that there is no difference in any part of this Muslim community about how we see Muslims in relation to ourselves, inshallah. Inshallah, Dr. Asim Qureshi, it's really been a fascinating conversation. Jazakallah khair for your time today. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.